Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to everyone, and thank you for joining us today for this edition of the Center for Student Opportunities College Partner Best Practices webinar series. Today's session will feature information and uh, expert opinions about first-gen leadership and career readiness programs. Um, we are really delighted to be able to offer this as a partnership benefit to our now community of nearly 200 college partners and university partners across the country. Um, to introduce myself uh, as someone who's still relatively new to the CSO team, my name is Ali Weavey, um, and it is a thrill to be able to work in support of first-gen college access and success. Um, you will hear from me steadily over the coming uh, weeks and months regarding programming and some new exciting things on the horizon. And thank you all for your support over the past nearly 10 years CSO, CSO has existed. So why webinars? Uh, before we begin this, it's very important for us just to take a moment to explain why we at CSO believe this is such a key component of our partnership. We really are interested in shedding, uh, shedding light on some of the best work across the country done by our college and university partners around issues pertaining to first-gen success. Um, we really also have seen a lot of value in focusing on some micro examples of specific programming on campus that really has been demonstrated to, uh, to ensure this success and promote it. Um, and so that's really where we bring our attention today. So without further ado, um, I just want to give a, just a, a couple of brief introductions and then head uh, over to pass the mic as it were to our featured panelists who will share information about their programs. Again, my name is Ali Levy, uh, and, and here is a, a new shot of what I look like for all those who are wondering. And most importantly, today's webinar spotlight. Um, today's program will feature the work of University of Florida and Cornell College um, and their work uh, and programs to support career readiness and leadership initiatives for first gen specifically. From uh, the Florida team, we are lucky to have with us Leslie Pendleton and William Atkins from the Mosh in Florida Opportunity Scholars Program, as well as Marissa Malbeck, who is actually a program alumnus and a current master's candidate in student affairs at Miami University of Ohio. Um, we also know that we are joined by some of Marissa's colleagues from Miami U University of Ohio today, and we are excited that they can join us. From the Cornell College side, we are joined today by Dr. Sue Astley and Kara Treble, who run the Rise Up program at Cornell. And one thing to note, and what will be particularly interesting today, is we have chosen to focus our work on spotlighting programs at two very different institutions, and not just in terms of the scale of the size of the institution and who they need to serve. And this will be further illuminated at, in the comments and, and, and stories that they can share about their work, something we're very excited about. Um, so without further ado, and just to give a brief uh, description of what will happen moving forward, we'll pass the mic over to our expert panelists. We've elected to have a questions uh, portion at the end after both uh, institutions have presented. So please use the question function. I will do my best to MC that later. Um, and thank you in advance for your participation. That's always a great part uh, of this experience. We also hope that this will run just around 40 to 45 minutes. And we also will make sure that this recording is shared at the end to anyone who was unable to join us. So without further ado, I will now mute my mic and open the mic of my colleague, Leslie Pendleton, who will now speak from University of Florida. Terrific. Thank you so much, Allie. Um, and good afternoon, colleagues. I usually say hello from sunny Florida. Um, however, today is kind of a nice we're not covered in snow, um, as some of you might be. So thanks again for your interest um, in your already likely very, very good work um, supporting first generation students across the country. Um, so to give you a little bit of context and overview of the program that we have here at the University of Florida, um, I want to talk a little just about the origin and mission of the program. Um, back in the early 2000s, um, leading up to the program launching in 2006, um, we, we saw some yield struggles at the University of Florida. Um, first generation and low income students um, were definitely being admitted to the university, um, but they were not opting to come, um, likely because of costs and other struggles that many of you um, are pretty familiar with. Um, we are a land-grant um, institution, and so linked to that mission um, to serve students and people of the state, um, really wanted to increase our 
support, outreach, access um, to first-generation low-income students here at the University of Florida. And so um, the Match in Florida Opportunity Scholars Program rose out of that desire to further educate, connect with, support first and low-income students of the state. Um, the program started, as I mentioned, launched in 2006. We, at the time, did not have a full-time director or committed staff, and frankly, a, a good reason for that was because we weren't really sure how the program was going to grow or develop um, or how successful it would really be. And so from 2006 and still to present, we have a, an advisory committee of about 10 to 12 professionals across the campus who are really dedicated to supporting this population. Um, and from 2006 to 2009, we only served, or we only had the advisory committee. Um, and then in 2009, once um, the program was here for three years and showing some demonstrated success, we were able to um, fund a full-time director, um, which is my, my current position. So the mission of our, our program is obviously, um, you know, as I mentioned, directly linked to access for first-generation low-income students coming to the University of Florida. But another really key part of that mission is the success elements and helping them um, not only matriculate to UF but persist, um, you know, do well academically, do well personally, connect on our campus, and then and then graduate at equal to or even slightly better um, rates than the rest of our population here. Uh, program eligibility, uh, we award students it's a scholarship and a support program. And so um, we award students coming in as admitted freshmen, and it is a four-year program. Um, so we admit around 300 incoming students to the Match and Florida New Scholars Program every year. Um, and you'll see our total numbers are, are close to around 1,200 students at any given time are supported by the program. Um, early on, there were definitely some concerns from administrators, I'll tell you, uh, kind of campus-wide, saying, you know, I'm not sure anybody's going to want to wear your t-shirt or really identify with this program. Uh, because it is for first-generation low-income students. Um, and, and again, back in the early 2000s, again, there were some you know, concerns of, of would students really want to regularly identify um, with the program. And so we were very intentional in the naming of the program, calling our students scholars. Um, they're all admitted to the University of Florida prior to being selected for our program. Um, and I don't have too much time to go into the selection elements, but I'm happy to talk later with individuals who want to learn a little more. Uh, but the first step is they have to be admitted um, through our rigorous admissions process. Um, from there, they you know, complete the FAFSA and our, our Office of Student Financial Affairs reviews um, some supplemental information gathered from students to really narrow down who are the top, you know, the 300 students who are, are, are um, you know, highly needy in terms of financial, um, financial need to select for those 300. Every year we have another 150 to 200 students at UF who, if we had all the funding in the world, um, we definitely would be able to include them in the program. One of the really key components we found is the institutional commitment on the entire institutional level. Um, the name Matchin is our former president, President Matchin, um, who was here at the time in the early 2000s to help launch the program. Um, he and his wife were the number one supporters of the program and really wanted to see it happen. Um, and that definitely had a trickle-down effect um, all across campus to so our academic affairs partners as well as our student affairs partners. And that, that continues today. Um, some measures we track in terms of success, things that many of you might already track as well, um, retention, graduation rates of our scholars, uh, the per graduate and professional school going rate. About 36% of our alums are going on to graduate and professional schools. Um, we use the National Clearinghouse data to track some of that. Um, student academic progress, we you know, work in conjunction with our academic partners, our faculty members, to give us feedback mid-semester about how our scholars are doing. Um, and my team will reach out and um, have conversations with students who might be uh, struggling academically. Um, and often, as many of you know, we find that there's other things they're struggling with as well. Um, it's not always just um, struggling academically in the classroom. And so, those one-on-one -on -one connections with students uh, we found to be really um, helpful in, in working with them. Um, we checked dollars raised where uh, a good majority of our funding does come from fundraised money, and so you know we keep track of that. And then program assessments as well as <clears throat> kind of learning from our scholars about how are they experiencing the university, the climate, um, the program elements, are they helpful, um, that sort of thing. So just a little bit of background on, on the program itself. So if you want to switch slides there, Allie. So the scope of the program, again, I mentioned 2006 is when we began. You can see we've served just about 3,600 individual students over the course of, of the history of the program. Um, nearing 2,000 in terms of the number of, of graduates, you're going to hear from one of them in just a minute. Um, and, and currently we have a little over 1,200 students who are enrolled this spring semester who are in our program. 
Staff and funding, um, our staff is small but mighty. You saw on the very first slide myself and Will Atkins. We are the two full-time staff members um, to run this program. We have two graduate assistants as well as an AmeriCorps VISTA um, that we applied for. Her role really though is, is working more in the community here in North Central Florida, less working directly with our scholars in this program. Um, and then we have a 10 hour a week student assistant as well. Um, we're physically located though in the Vice President for Student Affairs office space um, here in one of our main administration buildings. Again, going back to that institutional commitment um, that we found has been so important. Uh, a little bit about our scholars, the profile here you can see um, low income is one of the eligibility requirements. Our scholars family income has to be $40,000 or less to be considered uh, for the program, but clearly um, our scholars family income is well under that. Here at UF, we're a pretty wealthy campus, all things considered, so right there is you know, a comparison for you that the majority the average family here um, makes over $100,000. And so, as you can imagine, and as some of you likely already know from your work, uh, you know, our first generation low income students sometimes really feel like fish out of water, like they don't belong here. So, we do some intentional social um, engagement and work with them as well. Uh, we represent, our scholars represent 62 out of the 67 counties in Florida. Our retention number is there. You can see how really solid, as well as graduation rates. This is a breakdown of, of our racial demographics um, to, to give you an idea of, of the scholars in our program. And as I mentioned before, 36% um, go on to graduate professional school, which is actually pretty high the more we've looked into that. Um, right around 27% of bachelor's degree earners, um, aside from their first gen low income identity, go on to graduate or professional school. Um, and so for us, that's something we're really proud of. And then in 2013, while our staff did grow slightly. Um, our assistant director, Will Atkins, actually started with us. Gosh, Will, you're going to have to correct me. I think it was 2014. Um, but right before he came on board, we realized, and actually we knew all along, that we had other first generation students at UF, not just the Match in Florida Opportunity Scholars. And so um, some of our programs, and some I'm going to mention here next, um, we do, um, we look for, we want to include other first generation students at UF, not just those who are, are directly served by our scholars program. Next. Okay, so specific to the career readiness initiatives, um, we, we try to thread career readiness through all different kind of points in time for our scholars. Um, first and foremost, um, all of our scholars are required to take our one credit hour seminar course, which we call First Year Florida. Um, and in that course is, is, again, they're all freshmen, but we, one of the assignments in there is, is writing like a passion paper, a career paper, focus on what do they see themselves kind of doing immediately after um, undergrad and then also kind of into the future. Uh, many of the courses also take visits to our Career Resource Center and so that early exposure um, to the different career initiatives on campus um, we found to be really helpful. I mentioned the one-on-one -on -one meetings that we have with scholars. We, we unfortunately, because there's two of us, um, can't reach all 1,200 of them, but over the course of their time at UF, we really do try to encourage them to come in and have one-on-one -on -one meetings with us. Um, we intentionally reach out to those who are identified as struggling. Um, however, that doesn't mean we only meet with the students you know, who are struggling. Um, but in all of those meetings, um, Will and I are both intentional about asking kind of some of those larger career questions. Um, you know, everything from, well, what does your parent think about you wanting to be a museum director? Um, to, you know, why are you interested in going, you know, to be an engineer? What about that field fascinates you? And so we weave that in um, kind of into our one-on-one -on -one interactions, even if the scholar is coming to us, you know, concerned about, I don't know, financial concerns, let's say. Um, we always try to kind of weave that into our, our conversations and, and are pretty intentional about doing that. Um, second year, all of our students are required to do two career planning workshops. Um, our Career Resource Center, again, as an institutional partner, um, helps in facilitating these career planning workshops, everything from building your resume to um, having selecting a career that really matches your passions and your values, um, helping them think about what internships might be appropriate um, in the future, um, those kinds of things. And I'm happy to give more, again, specifics on, on what those career planning workshops look like for any of you who want some more information. But all of our second year scholars are required to do um, one in the fall and one in the spring of those career planning workshops. And then our third year scholars, um, are required, and, and I say the word required, I mean they get scholarship funding, so they get money out of this program, and so that's clearly a pretty good carrot. Um, I, I would argue that probably several of them would, you know, choose to come to some of these workshops voluntarily, um, but definitely more, we see more of them through the door, and we know we have um, a connection or a high touch with them because, you know, they are also funded. So I recognize that there could be some, um, some challenges 
there for some of our campuses who don't have um, the scholarship funding tied to a program like this. But the third year planning workshops, honestly, um, they're required as well, and they um, are very far and wide. That's why it's called sort of life planning. Um, but they're called transition out workshops is what we refer to them. So anything from, um, we have one that's really popular, professional use of social media is, is one that's really popular. Um, we do kind of the stress, a stress workshop in transitioning out of college. Um, we do like grad school workshops. Um, a, a big, it's kind of an a la carte menu of a lot of sort of what's next um, for our scholars to help them start thinking about that. The Academy of Leadership is something we um, do for third and fourth year scholars as well as other first gen students on campus can participate. It's a year long leadership development um, experience that starts with a retreat. We do several workshops over the course of the year. They create their own summer experience, which for many includes um, internships, studying abroad, um, shadowing. They get to craft what they want to do. Um, the four areas that we focus on in the Academy of Leadership are leadership development, self-awareness, career preparation and planning and global citizenship. I was going to forget the fourth. Um, and global citizenship. So those are the four kind of um, learning outcomes that are woven throughout um, that, that Fossil Academy of Leadership. Again, happy to share specific, um, more specifics with folks if you're interested. Um, we have a life coach program also for our older scholars. Again, focus on helping them prepare for life after college. If you're first in your family to go to college, it's hard enough um, to navigate college. But if you're first in your family to you know graduate, which is all of our goals for you, um, then it, it's almost equally, if not sometimes a little harder even, for students to plan, like, what is next? No one in my family has applied to law school. I don't know one accountant in my, you know, network. And so how do I know what I'm getting into unless I have some direct experience and preparing for that? So the Life Coach Program, um, we train faculty, staff, and we have a couple of members of our Gainesville community who are serving as life coaches now. Um, and they, we pair them one-on-one -on -one with interested third and fourth year students who say, like, gosh, I just need a little bit of help. I need some coaching um, around preparing for what's next. And so um, at any given time, we've got about 60 pairs, so um, a coach and a coachee um, paired together, working together, um, helping them kind of map out what's next. I'll tell you that's a really low-cost um, program for us, by the way, and so are some of the other workshops. Um, but that one in particular is something that it takes some organization. Um, but it's not going to cost an arm and a leg to pull something like that off. And we found that it's been really successful. Um, the coaches on as much as the coaches, to be honest, because they learn a lot um, and have a good time working with the coaches too. Um, our program alumni, as I said before, we're nearing 2,000. Um, we have an online alumni map where our alums can opt to um, put in their contact information. And we encourage our younger scholars um, to reach out to those alums and ask, you know, what's it like to live in Chicago, or what's it like to, you know, um, work for Amazon or whatever they're they're doing? And so um, we we try to facilitate that network uh, between our current scholars as well as our um, program alumni. And we have a LinkedIn group as well. Um, again, also pretty low cost, takes some organization, um, but pretty low cost as well. Um, the hardest part there, as all of you probably know, is keeping up with the very transient alumni um, and keeping tabs on where they are and. Um, that's one thing that if I could wave a magic wand, that we would be able to continue to, to improve that aspect of the program. And then coming soon, um, which is the last little bit here, and I'm going to transition out, um, is the First Generation Advocate Program, um, which we're really excited about. This is a way, um, so again, back to the institutional commitment. I keep coming back to that, but it's so important. Um, anytime we give presentations or have conversations across campus here, and we're a big campus, um, er, people by and large say, how can I get involved? I really, I've loved working with first generation students in the past, or I'm a first gen student, like how can I give back to, you know, this community? And so um, the advocate program is a way for them to do that. So it's, it's all online, it's again launching soon, it's not there yet, um, but it's a way for faculty or staff or anybody um, really to indicate that they want to serve as an advocate. We have a couple training videos that they'll watch online um, and then list themselves there as an advocate. Um, and, and it's for current students who can um, reach out to them and just want to learn a little more about their career path or what they're all about. So it's a little less intensive than the Life Coach program. Okay, last thing I'll say is all the pictures, hopefully you've noticed, are all of our or several of our graduates. Um, one of our big mission pieces here is that we want to help students be successful um, and finish their college experience. But as I mentioned, we don't want to lose touch with them as, an, as alumni. Um, and so speaking of which, great transition, we have one of our alums, Marissa Malbeck, who's going to share a little bit um, with you next about her experience in the program. Thank you. Thanks, Leslie. Um, as Leslie said, my name is Marissa. I'm one of the alums of the MFOS program, and I graduated from the University of Florida. 
last year in May. Um, so I'm really excited to be here and share a little bit more on the micro level about the experience from a student perspective. Um, so first, we have like the recruitment and outreach initially. Um, so initially, there's not much outreach as far as before you get to the University of Florida. It's kind of just really excited to see um, a paper come in the mail that says you're a candidate for this scholarship and as a first gen low income student, you're really just excited to have that um, possibility to pay for college. So it was an unexpected gift and once I got to campus, what I thought would just be a monetary support system as far as the scholarship goes was truly a holistic program full of much more um, programmatic aspects and helping you transition in and through and then out of the university. Um, so that outreach, once you got to campus, was really special in regards to community building. Um, right off the bat, as Leslie suggested or told you, um, we have a first year Florida class, which is a seminar class for first year students. Um, that really instilled a sense of belonging in me as a first gen student and with my peers. We were paired with a first year Florida class um, paired with our peer mentor in the first year of Florida class. So my mentor was our instructor in that course, and then we were with all of my peers that were also her mentees. Um, so that formed a huge community initially that was very special in regards to having that support system right off the bat. Um, in regards to that, it really formed a um, family structure in the program, and so the community really showed like anyone struggling as a first-gen student, the entire family comes together and supports you. And a big piece of that is the facilitation through the um, staff in the office too. So they really care about the whole person and success as a scholar. Um, they want to see you successful and having a good academic life, but also being able to transition into your um, university life and being involved and not being scared in this huge university. Um, they do a really good job at instilling pride in the first gen identity. Leslie talked about that in the initial process of starting this program that people were worried about um, about that piece of were students going to want to wear this shirt? Are students going to be happy to showcase being a first gen low income student? And by the time I got there, it was really a unique program and something that myself and all my peers were really excited to share throughout the university and showcase by wearing our shirts and pins and buttons. Um, so it was kind of a, we are all in this together um, among myself and my peers. <clears throat> Moving into the high impact moments, they were really all of the ones that were listed on Leslie's um, last slide, but a few that I want to point out specifically um, were the peer mentoring component. So that really was a great part in allowing people to be leaders in our program and giving back to the students and scholars that come after them. Um, so being a peer mentor and receiving that guidance was a huge impact moment to get me through my transition um, and being a successful scholar. Another unique piece was the FOSSIL program, the Opportunity Scholars um, Academy of Leadership. That was a great component because it instills confidence in scholars, um, as well as just the baseline professional skills like etiquette and networking and how to do an interview and things that you don't really think about needing, but you really do later um, when you're trying to find internships, volunteer experiences, grad school, et cetera. Um, and that fossil, the Academy of Leadership really instills self-awareness and it grows you a lot throughout your year that you're in that academy. Um, and lastly, the Life Coach program that Leslie said, um, it really helped me guide, get, got, it really helped guide me through the grad application process. Um, I'm currently in a student affairs program and I was paired with a University of Florida student affairs program grad and she was great in helping me get that process together and um, recognize what it's going to be like in grad school. <clears throat> um, and the unique opportunity that I had to work with the program was great to see the program from a scholar's point of view, but also from behind the scenes student worker. And it instilled my passion for first gen work. And I have continued communication with the wonderful staff in the office. Um, 
So the Master Floor Opportunity Scholars Program really set me up for success, and um, I'm happy to speak more at the questions portion of the student experiences as well. Um, but we need to move into Cornell's great program also. Great. Thank you so much, Marissa, and thank you, Leslie, um, for sharing about the work happening at Florida. Uh, at this time, we will make the transition. Um, I would encourage all of you who had been uh, tuning into this portion to uh, to send your questions about Florida so that you keep, can keep them um, sorted in your mind, um, and we will be able to broach those at the end of the presentation. And now, um, uh, I will make the transition to bring on Sue Astley uh, from Cornell College. And Sue, are you there? Yes, I am. Wonderful. So uh, Sue is up and ready to go, and she can take it away. Great. Could you show the next slide? Thanks. Um, so I'm here with Kara Travel, who essentially serves as the assistant director of Rise Up, and uh, we are both first generation college graduates. Um, so let me say something first about Cornell. We are a small, selective liberal arts college in eastern Iowa. By small, I mean we have fewer than 1,200 students. Um, we are about 30 miles north of Iowa City, um, where the University of Iowa is, and about 20 miles of Cedar Rapids, which is a small industrial city. Um, in the incoming class of this year, 25% of our students were uh, self-identified as first generation. So today I want to say a little bit about the origin of, origin of Rise Up. I want to talk about our specific uh, program elements and also the general features. And I want to say a little bit about uh, our outcomes so far. Next slide, please. So um, I got involved uh, in Rise Up uh, because I was faculty director of the Cornell Fellows Program. I still am. I've done that for about three and a half years. Um, Cornell Fellows is Cornell's uh, premier internship program. And we call it that because the fellows go to kind of unique settings. So we've had students, for example, doing uh, community development work in India. We've had uh, a number of students at Children's Hospital in Colorado doing a variety of things. Um, also, the student who does a fellowship has a personal project at their fellowship site. Um, these fellowships are competitive, as you might imagine. Um, students need to complete a personal statement, uh, do a resume get a recommendation from a faculty sponsor, and also do an interview. Um, and uh, one of the perks of the Cornell Fellowship is that there are funds sufficient for students to pay most of the expenses that they might incur in a fellowship. So we pay for things like housing, transportation, and so on. Um, as a first generation college graduate, I became a little concerned that students might not um, know about these opportunities early on in their time at Cornell. I know that I didn't come to college thinking that I would do an internship or being aware of college of uh, opportunities on campus. Um, and so I was a little concerned that maybe first generation students really weren't taking advantage of fellows in the way they should. Um, I did a rough study of two years worth of fellowships. Um, and I found that there were a number of first generation students in that group but not in the same proportions as continuing generation students. Um, so um, RJ Holmes Leopold was director of the Career and Civic Engagement uh, Office here at Cornell at that time. He and I prepared a grant proposal to Arthur, the Arthur Vining Davis Foundation. Um, we had and have full-time plus jobs, so we knew that we didn't have the time to devote to the, uh, the individual contact with students that this program would require. So we asked for funding in the uh, grant for a staff person. And Kara Trouble is the person we're very fortunate to have um, as the, the face of our program. Um, we also knew that we were likely to, if we were successful, likely to increase demand for the Cornell Fellows Program. Uh, we didn't want to deny other people fellowships to accommodate these new these new uh, applicants. So another part of the funding for the program is to expand the Cornell Fellows Program. Um, so uh, what I'm going to talk about today in terms of our program, our program elements are three. One is academic advising. Um, a second uh, element is workshops that we do throughout the academic year. Um, and finally, a career-relevant individual opportunity for the student. Next slide, please. 
So um, we have, uh, I guess we like to do things in threes. We also have three goals. Um, one of our goals is to increase student knowledge about careers and also about career-related opportunities on campus. We have a number of pre-existing opportunities for students to learn about careers, and we want to make sure that they know about that very early in their time at Cornell. So we talk about those in, the, in their very first year. Um, we also want to increase their career-related skills, and those aren't just to get careers at the end of their uh, time at Cornell, but also these are skills that will help them to get these special opportunities that will help them be prepared for careers. So for example, we do a workshop on writing a personal statement. Writing a personal statement is important, of course, for graduate school. It's also important for getting a Cornell Fellowship, and so we want to know that students know what a personal statement is and how to create one. Um, we also, for example, talk to them about how to apply for programs. So our students, we have a session on how do you apply for off-campus study and what kind of off-campus study opportunities are there. Um, we also want to increase their general confidence and give them a sense of more interpersonal support. Um, so we know that uh, first-generation students come to campus understanding that they don't know very much about college and they may have uh, knowledge about only a limited range of possible careers and so we want to fill that gap for them. Um, we also know that especially at a selective liberal arts college people might feel as though there aren't others like them uh, with their family situation or their, their financial constraints. And so we want to make sure that our first generation students meet other first generation students so they don't feel quite so isolated. And also that they meet first generation faculty and staff. We have quite a few here at Cornell, so we connect them with the students as well. So the general features of our program, first of all, are that it's it began as a collaboration and continues a collaboration between Academic Affairs and our Career Engagement Center. Um, I'm a faculty member in psychology. I'm housed in an academic building. Um, the co-director of the program is the current director of our Career and Civic Engagement Center, Jason Napoli. Um, he and Kara have an office in our student center, uh, which is where the Career and Civic Engagement Center is. Um, and so that collaboration really brings the perspectives and the resources of those two different aspects of the college um, to, be, to be there for our students. And so we've, we have really been very pleased with that particular model. Um, we also use a cohort model and an assets-based approach. Let me say a little bit about what we mean by that. So we want to, uh, as uh, Marissa has described, we want to create a connection between the students. So we want them to feel like they're familiar faces on campus, students that they can talk about with about their personal situation who will understand some of those constraints. Um, and we've been really uh, very pleased with at least our informal sense of how that goes. Students seem to just blossom when they know that there are others around who are like them. Um, the asset-based approach is kind of a counter to some of what, sh what shows up in the research liter on, literature on first-generation students. A lot of that is based on exploring what the deficits might be that first-generation students have. Of course, there are challenges that first-generation students face. But we have um, uh, the terminology that's come out of community development and that, that's now um, gone into education is this uh, idea of an asset-based approach. That is, thinking about what the assets are of the community or the individual and then building from there. And that really is the, the primary focus of our program. So the very first question on our application for students who'd like to be in Rise Up is, what strengths do you feel you bring to Cornell? Um, and they are very eloquent about the strengths that they feel they bring here. They feel that they are very self-reliant, um, that they have an excellent worth, work ethic, um, and that they have a lot of interpersonal skills. And we found that to be very true. Um, and we reinforce that message as often as we are able to do. Um, and then we also uh, stay with the students for, we hope to stay with the students for their four years here at Cornell. And we have different programming, as does the matching program, for each year of the students' um, activity in the program. Um, so we do different things for first year students than for sophomores and so on. Um, our goal for the program was to, to have 15 students uh, complete the program. 
uh, uh, 15 students who are active in the program. Of course, we have a number of other students who apply but don't end up being active. We are, in general, exceeding our goal. So we get it in our current group, uh, who are juniors, the most senior group, um, we have about 22 students who have been active throughout the program. Um, we expect them to continue to be active during senior year. So we're doing pretty well in terms of our, our targeted goals. Let me just mention a couple of other general features of our program before I turn on to turn to program elements. Um, we did not want to duplicate any other services on campus. So we have lots of really excellent resources on campus. I've talked a little bit about our career center. They do excellent resume workshops. They do workshops on finding an internship and so on. We want to just um, encourage our students to attend those workshops and not replace those. Um, we also uh, have a really first-rate center for teaching and learning here. They work with students on their papers. We have a quantitative portion of that center. Um, we partner with those, uh, those offices at Cornell. Um, we don't want to duplicate what they do. Um, but we do do workshops of our own on more global topics, um, and we always try to keep a first-generation lens on when we do those. Uh, we want to make sure that the students feel personally connected to what we're talking about and that they feel this program is really directly about them. Um, so uh, we recruit students in the summer before they come to Cornell. So we have a list of first-generation students that admissions provides for us. Um, and we make contact with them by email and also by phone in the summer before they come so we can explain the Rise Up program and find out if they're interested. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, so our program elements are, first of all, um, each Rise Up student has a, an academic advisor who has volunteered to have about half of their advising load be Rise Up students. Um, these are faculty members who are really first-rate academic advisors. Uh, most of them are first-generation college graduates themselves, so they know what the experience is of coming to college as a first-generation student. Um, they, um, uh, those who aren't first-generation do a workshop over the summer. Uh, we do a workshop on careers and career-related skills, so many of our workshops relate to those topics. And that's especially where we try to make sure we have a first-generation lens. Many of those include a panel of individuals talking about their experiences, and either all of the members of the panel or many of the members of the, of the panel will be first-generation graduates. Uh, of course, uh, first-generation students have more general concerns. And um, so we, uh, we do workshops on those, differences in family support or pressure, um, finances. Um, we do a workshop on the economic value of a college degree. And that workshop is followed up by, by a small group computer lab uh, workshop searching for scholarships. We do not offer scholarships. So that's a way we try to be helpful. Our main goal is that students get a directly career-relevant experience, at least one of them, before they graduate from college. Um, I'll say a little more about that on the next slide. So if I could have the next slide, please. So here are some things we've seen as outcomes. So one of our goals uh, for the first year of the program, for students' involvement in the first two years of the program, is that we want their confidence to increase and we want their connection to the college to increase. Um, we did a comparison with some control group members, and we found that there were increases in Rise Up students in measures of academic adjustment, and also increases in grade point average. We also saw, compared to the control group, increases in campus involvement, and also increases in campus leadership. Um, we currently have 22 students who are juniors, or if they have transfer credit, they're seniors. Um, and this is the first group that's eligible for Cornell Fellows. Um, we have targeted some additional career-relevant experiences in addition to fellows that students might, depending on their skills and their interests, might better fit them. Uh, we have five of this group of 22 who have already completed uh, an internship, uh, faculty, faculty student research, um, or off-campus study. We expect more students to finish one of those experiences by the end of the year. Um, nine of the students in that cohort are uh, on track to complete a Cornell Fellowship by the end of summer. Um, one student is currently completing a fellowship right now. That's, um, that's Elizabeth Fleck, who's on the right portion of the picture that you see, you see before you. Um, 
Eight more are at the application stage, uh, but I've talked to all of their academic advisors and I know about their academic record and their interest in a fellowship, um, and I expect that all of them will be extremely strong candidates for, for Cornell Fellows. Um, so they should complete those fellowships over the summer, and a few more students may complete a fellowship as, as a senior. Um, so we feel we have um, gained substantial success so far in the, in the Rise Up program. We're on target. Uh, on our target. Um, we, of course, have challenges. Um, and we work those out each year and are trying to do some improvements in the program every year to help to help improve those aspects as we continue the program. But we're very pleased with Rise Up, and I'm really glad to have had the opportunity to talk to you about it today. Thanks. Thank you so much, Sue. So looking forward, um, there are several questions in the queue, and thank you for those who've, uh, who've entered them. Um, I'm going to read them aloud uh, just because at times we've seen that the mic functions may not work as well. So I'm going to read them aloud. I will identify you, and then I'm going to open up the mics uh, for, um, uh, for our panelists to, to address the questions themselves. So the first question, um, and let me just queue it up here, is from... Right. All right. The first question comes from Jared Green, and, and his question, and I, I suppose this is for both, so maybe first we can start with Leslie and then we can have Sue or any other members of your team if they'd like to weigh in. The question is, how, does the, how do these programs differ solely from student support services? And additionally, do you have a student support service office that uh, serves as a replacement um, to whatever services you're not offering? Do you want to take that one? So maybe we can have uh, Leslie um, on your end start. Well, I think when you say student support services, you mean the federally funded TRIO program, I think. Um, so that is actually um, a new program that is just getting underway and just launching here at the University of Florida. Um, we have student affairs support services and things you know, in place for all of our students. I think kind of what Sue was talking about, thing that I didn't necessarily mention in our approach too, it is very strength-based or asset-based approach. Um, and we also try to weave in the first generation angle um, a lot. I mean, I, my students hear me say all the time, you're first to come to college, but you're also going to be first to graduate. Um, and so again, thinking intentionally about what are the needs of first generation students and how can we tailor kind of our approach to supporting that specific, um, you know, kind of group of students through a student affairs, student services um, kind of model. And so I don't know that that totally answered your question, but we are familiar with the SSS program, and that is something that um, is going to be launching here at UF fairly soon to serve um, additional students who are first-gen, low-income, and students with disabilities, too. Great. Thank you. And, and Sue or Kara or anybody on, on the Cornell side, is there anything that you want to add about how this is perhaps different from student support services? Sure. Um, we also do not have, um, if you're referring to the um, TRIO program, we do not have a TRIO program on this campus. Um, but I would say that it didn't necessarily um, seek to serve the same purpose and that it really does have a career focus as um, we, we kind of weave in some academic components to it. Um, but it's not the primary focus of our specific program. And um, I would also say that along with that, something that maybe differs about this program is because it's situated within the Career and Civic Engagement Center, that office as a whole has sort of started conversations more about how to better reach out to first-generation students. Um, and I guess that's kind of in a different setting than where those conversations typically happen on campus, which tends to be more on the academic advising side or on the um, college access and admissions side of things, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. Um, switching gears here, I have a question from Rosalba Ramirez, and she's asking, is there an academic requirement? Um, I guess this is more for, for Florida, but it, it could be answered by, by Cornell as well. But is there an academic requirement to be accepted into the Opportunity Scholars Program? Um, and does the program offer any kind of scholarship? Will, do you want to take this one? Uh, Will, are you there? OK. I'm here. Thanks. So yes, we um, we do require that our scholars who are selected maintain a certain grade point average, but to actually be selected as a scholar, um, it's really through the UF admissions process. So we look at the student or the admissions office looks at the student based on their criteria, 
and then uh, following their admissions, they'll fill out more information regarding their income and family background. And from there, our financial aid office uh, makes a selection of the students. And then once they're in our program, um, they're required to maintain a, at least a 2.0 GPA. Um, on average, our scholars earn on par or above the all UF average, which is around the 3.33 uh, UF GPA. And so from that point, uh, we work with them on maintaining academic success. But that's our um, minimum requirement, 2.0. We also do have the scholarship piece attached to the GPA requirement. Great. Thank you, Will. Um, briefly, uh, Sue or anyone from Cornell, is there anything that you wanted to add about the academic requirement for this piece and if there's any financial assistance attached to it? So um, we do not have an academic requirement um, and we do not offer scholarships. It's, it's really voluntary. We're really pleased that we've had so much participation. Um, I think students feel like they're getting something from our workshops and that's the main incentive for them. And also the carrot of a, us helping them get an internship or a fellowship. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Um, so another question comes to us from uh, Ingrid Renderos from Rutgers University, Newark. And her question is, how were you able to get first-gen faculty and staff involved? And if you could speak a little bit about the process. So I'm going to open the mic for Leslie here from Florida. Um, if that's an element of your program, are you able to speak on that? Yeah, sure. This is Leslie. I mean, as I mentioned, our first generation are our life coaches as well as our first gen advocate program um, is primarily faculty and staff from across campus. Um, and how we were able to do that, honestly, I think it's, you know, demonstrating excitement and, you know, um, around sort of serving this population and um, helping our, you know, a lot of times, I, and I think what Sue said too is makes total sense. Um, our first gen faculty and first gen staff who are also first generation um, sort of realize their kind of college experience and want to be helpful and pay it forward. Um, and so, you know, you might start there to find out is there, you know, a listserv of faculty, staff, or people that you can send out and say, you know, we want you to get involved in this initiative. You know, could you self-identify as somebody who's first generation who would be interested in, in supporting those, um, the first gen students on our campus. And the other thing that works too is um, kind of grabbing testimonies from students about those who have been influential mentors over, you know, before a program even launches. I'm sure you already have really active staff and faculty um, who could be highlighted or, you know, a shout out on social media, maybe a photo of that student and, and their mentor. Um, and then that sort of trickles down and, and encourages others to, to maybe get involved. Um, I don't know, those are just some quick thoughts. Um, hi, this is Sue. Um, I'd like to comment a little on that. Um, one of the challenges that we realized in the planning stage for Rise Up is that people here, here are so busy that it would be really difficult for them to do additional, a lot of additional work on top of the job that they're already doing. Um, so our initial model was to have um, the Rise Up mentors be doing work on top of their regular job. And, and we realized that that may not be as workable as actually incorporating it into a part of their job. So um, our Rise Up mentors are academic advisors, and they regularly have a number of new academic advisees coming in for them. Um, but in this case, um, they, uh, they are due, they're working with the Rise Up students as a part of their regular job. They know that they might need to give additional attention to them, so we ask them to check in with their Rise Up mentees on a really regular basis throughout the year. Um, they also come and help us with workshops, but folding it into a part of their regular work was really helpful for us in getting people to just volunteer to do it, um, to volunteer to be a Rise Up mentor. Great, thank you for that. And, and I, I guess um, we, we were too quick uh, before, and I think Marissa is ready now and standing by. Marissa, your mic is open. Can you address this, if you will? Yes. Can you hear me now? Absolutely. 
Okay. And what what would you like me to chat about, Ali? Well, potentially, if you had any opportunity through uh, you know your UF program to interact with any first gen faculty or first gen uh, mentors or career specialists, did you did you sense that there was um, a good interplay between the kind of positive first gen identity that you and your cohort members were experiencing and them? Did you ever have conversations about that? Yeah. Um, so the first thing that comes to mind in regards to first-gen faculty is um, the Vice President for Student Affairs, who um, I was able to work in that office with him and the um, staff there, but also with the MFOS office, and he um, shared that he was a first-gen student, and he was always, always a great mentor in regards to that, um, always sharing that he believed in us and made sure that we knew he um, shared the same identity. Um, so that was really special, and the first gen advocates uh, or first gen like life coach, life coaches, and um, like the fossil uh, facilitators. Some of them would be first gen uh, graduates as well, like Leslie said. Um, and just connecting with them really formed a great community to see that there is success and that we can really do it, especially if we ever were questioning that piece, which I definitely did, and I know peers did as well. Of whether we could really reach that successful um, first-gen grad status and having those peers and mentors above us be able to say, yes, you can, was a great piece to our success. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Marissa. Um, so I, I see we have time for one more question because I want to ensure that we get out uh, before the hour is up. Um, so just a, a question, I'm, I'm seeing a couple that fly in here. I'm trying to just get one. And for any additional questions that are not uh, answered, we will make sure we, we answer them after the fact. Uh, so this question um, comes in um, for from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, um, and this is from uh, Ms. Tracy, and uh, the question is how are, what effective outreach are you using um, and through, uh, through what means to promote a first-gen program without a scholarship program, uh, a commitment attached to it? Or, so so what, what are you saying in your outreach to demonstrate the value of this without a dollar sign attached to it? Oops, I'm going to go ahead and unmute Leslie's mic. So, Leslie, you're on. Um, and I can also add Will if you'd like me to. Feel free, I can add Will. I'll, I'll start by saying we have, um, I haven't mentioned it yet, but a first generation student organization on campus that's pretty active. Um, they're advised through our office, but they're not all opportunity scholars on a scholarship. Um, and so I think using kind of the student word of mouth, again, I mentioned student testimonials. We have a lot of them all over our website. Um, from scholars and non-scholars who have participated in some of our programming. I think students hear best from each other, um, so that, that's definitely one way. One of our grad assistants is specifically um, assigned to working with um, first-generation student population here at UF that are not scholars. Um, and so, you know, again, his outreach, everything from the email listservs, of course, and social media, trying to hook in um, other um, first-gen students. I'm happy to share uh, like examples of the language that we've used after the fact if somebody wants to reach out. Um, Will, do you want to chime in? Yeah, I'll also add that we're currently working with our registrar's office to develop and build a, a listserv for all first-generation college students at UF. I mean, that will be something that we work with the financial aid office as well to um, make sure that we are keeping that record up to date. Um, so that will be a really great way for us to get the word out about different first generation opportunities like the Life Coach program, the uh, Fossil program, uh, the Advocate, the Advocate program, as well as our first generation student organization. And so I think that's one way that we're trying to uh, build some outreach. As students go and participate in our different programs, I think that they, like Leslie mentioned, spread the word and let their friends know that you don't have to be in the Florida Opportunity Scholars program to benefit from this resource. Uh, we also encourage students, if they know friends who are um, having some challenges or want to talk through some things or they're thinking about changing majors or thinking about you know studying abroad or doing an internship and they're also first generation college, a first generation college student, we encourage our scholars to tell their, fr their friends to also come to us. So some of the relationships and the networking and the outreach is organic um, with, our, with our students broad reach on campus. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Leslie and Will. And, and finally, I'm opening your mic, Sue. If there's anything you want to add about how you're effectively promoting this without a scholarship piece attached to it. 
Sure, this is Kara. Um, Kara. I think one of the things that we do uh, to promote the program uh, is we don't just promote it to the students, but we also talk to families and parents as well. Um, and I think that's been kind of successful, and then the parents encourage the students to take part, and we actually have some contact with some of the parents um, and families. And we do that in some admissions events before there are ever students at Cornell, and then also in sometimes in the summer before uh, they come to Cornell and in the recruitment process for the program itself. Um, so I think what getting some of the family support on board has helped. Uh, and it kind of re maybe relieves some of the nerves of some of the parents as well to know that there's a program specifically for their students to get a little extra support. Um, as Will mentioned, we also do a lot of the organic um, bring a friend kinds of uh, banking on word of mouth, I guess, and kind of coming with a friend. I think the students are more likely to attend our events when they have a friend in the program that will um, attend with them. Um, so we rely on that a lot as well. And then I think one other piece is that we sort of um, introduce ourselves as a one-stop shop for resources. And so I, I kind of find students coming into my office for a whole lot of questions that are kind of outside of the um, general purview of the program, but they come in to ask those questions anyway because they just, I'm the first person that they met on campus. Um, so I think kind of serving as the one-stop resource and then um, uh, outsourcing, I guess, their questions to other folks and getting them connected elsewhere has also helped us um, keep them engaged. Great. Thank you. So I'm looking at the time, and so I am, I'm going to, to cut this here, but I assure you we will take additional questions and have our panelists respond to them and, and circulate them to those who, who registered. Um, as a reminder, uh, you can contact our expert panelists. Here is their information. I will circulate a recording of this, uh, of this webinar as well as the PowerPoint that we use so that you're able to share it with your colleagues and also refer back to it, but really want to thank our colleagues from Florida and Cornell for taking the time to, to share their um, expert opinions and, and share this best practice of serving first gens in this way. Um, I really want to encourage everyone to keep the conversation going. Uh, those of you who are here who received this invitation uh, to join the webinar through our College Partner Exchange, please use that to respond, reply, and, and think through some of the topics we've broached today. If you are not on the College Partner Exchange, but are a member of a partner institution who received the invitation today, please reach out to me and I will make sure to add you. And finally, I'm just excited to be able to, to share news of welcome um, to several of our new partners. We have a few more that are joining, but just a few of the partners that have joined in this most recent recruitment cycle. You can see some of the names there. A terrific range of schools um, and schools that are obviously seeing the value in joining this um, fantastic, as I say myself, uh, community of college partners committed to first-gen success. So thank you all so much for taking the time. Uh, we look forward to producing more of these in the future. Um, and please make sure to share this widely with any colleagues that you find helpful. For now, just want to say thank you for taking the time out and have a great day.